this. It's 4.07 p.m. Uh, and I'm going to read my uh, re required statements here. In accordance with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts executive orders suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, we are conducting this meeting virtually. The Public Works Commission is conducting this meeting September 9th, 2020 at four o'clock, starting now at 407. In the Zoom platform and in accordance with the town's policy directive and guidelines issued on April 1st, 2020 and amended May 7th. I ask that all Public Works Commissioners, town staff and presenters activate their video and mute their microphones unless they have something to say or are participating in committee dialogue. For members of the public, when I open the meeting for public comment in order to be recognized, please use the raise hand option in Zoom or use star nine on your phone. If you are recognized, please state your name and address. This meeting is being recorded and will be available later for viewing on the town's website. I, James Terry, hereby call this meeting to order. All commissioner votes will be taken by roll call. We will start by attendance roll call of the commissioners. When I announce your name, please reply. Jim Terry, present. Casey Winslow. Andrew Borden. Present. Peter Wallace. Present. Okay, thank you. The first item on our agenda is the review and approval of minutes of July 20th, 22nd, 2020. Are there any comments or suggestions from the board members? Peter Wallace, I move we approve. Thank you. Is there Thank a second? Second. Okay, all those in favor, again, it's going to be a roll call vote. Jim Terry, aye. Andrew? Aye. Peter? Aye. The meeting minutes of July 22nd are approved. We expect to have a meeting in October. However, at this date, the Date has not been finalized, so information will be on the town's website as soon as we know what that is. Typically, our meetings are on the second Wednesday of the month, and tip we recently we've been having them at four o'clock in the afternoon. And the question for the other board members, is four o'clock in the afternoon a convenient time for the Zoom meetings? It appears that we will be continuing to have uh, virtual meetings like this for some time. Andrew or Peter? Peter Wallace, yes. Uh, yeah. Okay, so from that standpoint, Alan, I think we ought to continue with the four o'clock uh, on the second Wednesday timeframe and we'll go from there. Okay, uh, and Jim, we'll, we'll try to get back on a schedule and routine. And again, we've typically done it the second Wednesday of the month. I think at this point, the town meeting in the summer, it was a little unusual, but you know, I think what we'll do is probably propose a calendar with the next packet so we can kind of see those dates and sort of anticipate um, you know, how the, the board's um, schedules uh, compare and uh, then get back into a more of a routine. I expect that'll happen. Probably okay, that'd be great. AC Winslow has just joined the meeting. Thank you, Hannah. So the next item on our agenda was to be a public hearing on the Cuca Road water main extension. However, that has been postponed, so we will not be discussing that uh, today. And the next item on our agenda is 14A Central Street, a sewer eligibility appeal. Alan, do you want to take the start on this? Yeah, Jim, just in the interest of the audience, and I know um, I just want to go back to the uh, Kuka Road extension. I think there's a lot of interest in that uh, water main, and we only learned as of yesterday, when we go through the normal process, they put together all the information. There was a requirement to uh, create a, uh, a butters list uh, notification and um, they had failed to provide uh, the uh, certified mail um, in accordance with our, our regulations. And so we spoke with the applicant uh, yesterday and we found that out and we had to um, uh, be scheduled on, um, because without that abutters list and, and formal notice, uh, we couldn't hold the hearing. So I just apologize to the people who might have been interested there was some considerable confusion that was introduced because our process was not necessarily followed. And I think there was an attempt to provide notice, 
but I think the attempt was actually more confusing than the, the, the process that was uh, laid out in our regulations. So um, I just apologize to those people and individuals who were interested in that particular uh, topic. And again, as of yesterday, we found out. So um, right. I just put that out there because I know some of the interests of this uh, meeting were you know, relating to that hearing. Thank you. So w with regard to 19A Central Street, do you want to give us a little bit of background? Sure. Um, is Matt Seppi available? Okay, Matt, I see your... Um, yeah. Can you hear me okay, Alan? We can hear you. So Matt Seppi is the applicant. Um, uh, in essence, uh, he is responding to an administrative uh, denial of a sewer connection. Uh, on a property that is identified as uh, 19A Central Street. Um, I will uh, provide a couple images if that's helpful um, you know, to the board and allow Matt to provide a little, uh, little background. If you um, will see how the share works, hopefully uh, the board can see the, uh, the figure attached. Uh, Matt, can you see that? Yes, I can. So maybe you can speak to this and you will kind of you know, scroll through a couple slides and then I can provide some context um, after you've made your presentation. Sure. Um, for the record, my name is Matt Seppi and I'm at 4 Fletcher Road in Westford, Massachusetts. And um, as mentioned, I am the owner of the property that is showing on the slide as proposed lot one, which is referred to as 19A Central Street. Um, the building department on a side note has assigned it a formal address of 195 Central Street. Um, so I thought what I would do is try to give a little history of the property and then also identify what my plans were for the property moving forward to try to add some context to it for the commission. Um, so the property that is shown as lot one and lot two were owned, uh, I purchased lot one from an individual named David Lax. So David Lax owned lot one and lot two. He purchased those in 1994. When he purchased the property, it was one contiguous parcel that just had the single family dwelling. And that was uh, at 185 Central Street. That's what it was referred to at that time in 1994. In 1995, David submitted, uh, applied, and, and was approved for a building permit to add an addition to the existing single family home, but also to build an accessory structure, which would be utilized as an art studio. The, the art studio is about 650 square feet, its footprint. It does have some mezzanine and uh, loft levels. It's a one and a half story structure, but the general footprint of it's about 650 square feet. So the addition and the art studio were constructed in 1996. At that time, the, all the utilities that serviced the art studio came from the basement of 185 Central Street. That included natural gas, water, sewer, and electrical. Um, I purchased the property, uh, I entered into an agreement with David to purchase the property at the beginning of this calendar year. In April, we submitted a Title V review for a sewer connection, and along with that review, submitted a set of building plans for a four bedroom home that has an estimated capacity of 440 gallons per day. In August, we received the uh, letter that identified uh, for the sewer finding that it was denied based on a change of use in sewer. So uh, once I received that, I went back and re-reviewed the sewer rules and regulations. And I also re-reviewed the comprehensive wastewater management plan. And I felt that this particular lot did have some unique items to it that I felt it would be worth speaking with the commission and asking them to reconsider that finding. Um, some of the main items that I think that make this particular lot different is first off, 
it is it does have an existing dwelling that exists there today it was constructed in 1996 as i mentioned it's been connected to the sewer system since that time it's been utilized every day by the occupants that work and visit the art studio um, i think also in reviewing the, the rules and regulations and it, looking at some of the criteria necessary for a lot to have the ability to connect um, it is an a and r lot it does have adequate frontage. Um, it does have a connection now. So the capacity there is, there would be a modest increase in capacity from what's happening today. Um, and I also think from a public safety standpoint, this particular neighborhood has a lot of very small lots and it would be beneficial, I would think for, you know, parcels in this neighborhood not to have on-site systems and to be able to have connections to the sewer. Uh, also, when looking at the comprehensive wastewater management plan, if you look at pretty much this whole neighborhood that exists from Pine Street all down through Central Street over to Prairie Street, at the time of the plan, either the parcels are already on sewer or they were all identified to be on sewer. And I think it even notes within the, a lot of the different maps that, you know, it, the, the verbiage of it should not continue, these parcels should not continue to rely on on-site systems. Um, and also, I think in looking at the neighborhood too, as I mentioned, it's made of a lot of smaller parcels. And with those parcels that a lot of the houses have, um, you know, they try to keep the massing of the house down and they have uh, detached garages. And um, Alan, if you could call up maybe slide number, the exhibit, uh, well, you could leave it on exhibit two, that's fine. I could start with that. So I did work with my engineering group at Stamsky McNary and with my architect Ben Nickerson to come up with two potential options on how a new home could fit on this parcel. Um, the first one you see here is a home that has the garage attached to the house. And some of the negatives of this particular design is it does add a lot of massing to the building because the garage is connected and it also does disconnect the house from the backyard area. Um, we would follow this type of plan if we were trying to save some backyard space in order to do an on-site disposal system. A more preferred option we felt would be what is shown here in exhibit one. So this would allow for a detached garage. Um, again, many of the houses in this neighborhood have detached garages, the, the abutting homes at 165 Central, 175, 199, 205, they're all detached garages, the ones all right in a row with this. Um, this. This plan also does allow for a smaller house to, you know, as far as the massing of it, so it doesn't seem as large in comparison to others in the neighborhood. And it also provides occupants of the home from visibility into the backyard to watch children and so forth, which I think would be significant with this type of neighborhood because it is it is a family neighborhood that's here. So in you know in reviewing all those elements of it, I, I did feel that you know this particular lot does meet some of the spirit of what the sewer rules and regulation and the wastewater management plan was developed for. I do understand that it was subdivided, uh, you know it was subdivided by David in 2013 by David Lack. So it is, sub, it was subdivided after the rules and regulations were established. But outside of that particular item, I do feel that it, it did meet the spirit of a, a lot of the, the elements of the rules and regulations in the um, comprehensive wastewater management plan. Thank you, Matt. That, I think that's very helpful as to uh, understanding what the situation is. Are there questions from the commissioners with regard to the proposed plan and the uh, a a asking for the waiver? Um, I, I guess, um, Andrew Borman here, I, I guess my first question is, I'm assuming this is speculative build. It's not for you or, or is it under contract or how does that well, work? Well, that's a good question. So I had planned to do a speculative build, but um, I would have a, was approached by some folks that are on the call under William Warren, and they're a family that would be interested in a new home that could be constructed there. And they were 
definitely be in favor of the detached garage plan and, and felt very strongly that that would probably be the only way they want to move forward with the home because they, they currently have young child and would like to be able to watch them in the backyard and, and be able to keep an eye on them and felt that the, the design that showed the detached garage is much more favorable for them. Any other questions? Does the director have a recommendation? This is Peter Wallace. Yeah, uh, hi, Peter. Um, yes, the looking at the proposal, and you know, people on the board are pretty familiar with the wastewater capacity constraints that we we struggle with town wide. Um, I think we've realized that when we set the regulations in two thousand four, there was um, you know, it's you know, over. 16 years ago now, um, it was when we first learned of the wastewater capacity constraints at the treatment plant. As a reminder, we have a, a, a NIPTES EPA DEP permit for 1.2 million. Uh, we've been investing lots of money that we've collected through sewer improvement fees into removal of I and I. It's been you know, fairly successful. We've actually strategically maintained you know compliance with our permit you know to date, which is a pretty big deal. And we also recognize that with some of the envisioned Concord and the long-term planning interests of the community, that there is an interest in encouraging um, what I call sort of the right size, you know, residential um, uh, development. Um, we note that at the upcoming town meeting, there is a uh, article that's going to be addressing uh, attached uh, dwelling units and, uh, you know, trying to incentivize, um, you know, some, um, a little bit more um, increase in residential population without really changing the nature of the neighborhoods. I think as Matt represented, this is a situation where we've actually had appeals in the past to um, allow for existing structures to be modified. Um, what's different, and I will highlight that this, uh, the specific um, request uh, is to uh, get in a uh, appeal the provision that any parcel of real property abutting a public sewer that is divided into two or more parcels after the effective date of this regulation, that was April 6, 2004, shall be entitled to one single sewer connection. And really at the time it was the envisioned if we had new sewers expanded to neighborhoods and there were large tracts of land that it could potentially uh, enable unintended consequences on development as well as capacity. And for the board, the reminder is it's the wastewater capacity that's the control and the governor, not so much the planning, but it was complementary to planning. So I'd say that this particular proposal seems to be fairly unique. The one interesting component and one challenging component we see is that the land, the property was subdivided without water sewer knowledge and when it was subdivided we then ended up with a uh, non-conforming water sewer connection to this structure so that's a problem and moving forward you know i always look at well how do we not repeat this or what you know what kind of precedence is this and i think we can say uh with confidence that we're moving towards a permit tracking software system we've talked about that before which is interdepartmental which will allow us to be notified of these sorts of activities and you know, uh, we'll build in a review so that at the time of the subdivision, we can flag this non-conforming situation and make sure it's you know, identified and addressed at that time. So it's, it's very unusual. we subdivided. The existing use didn't really change as the studio and as Matt presented, they're just replacing the structure with another structure in a neighborhood which is you know, sort of seems to be uh, indicative of the neighborhood. So we don't see this as a real, um, it's, we, we think it's an opportunity for the board to allow relief without necessarily exposing capacity constraints. As Matt said, it's a single family uh, use. I think the board typically gets involved with anything over a thousand gallons per day because that's really a capacity issue. This is sort of a residential density issue. So, so I, my recommendation is I don't see it would be uh, a, any major 
challenge to the rules and regulations as they exist. Are, th are they committing to um, sort of the maximum conservation, water conservation measures that we would be interested in? Matt, um, what would you have to say as far as commitments to uh, the high efficiency water conservation to it reduces water demand as well as wastewater impact as well? Is that something you'd consider? Yes, I think we can, we'd be open to considering that. Uh, I see that Melissa's on the call and I've worked with her in the past on our project that I did um, to try to satisfy a lot of the requirements for um, I'm going to try to satisfy some of the requirements for reduced water usage and uh, be open to doing that again. Are there any other questions or comments from the commissioners? Well, I just wanted to say that um, the way I see it, it's fully conforming lot and in, in every other way. So just the fact that there was a studio there really isn't much different than being a single family there in terms of density or you know, by, you know, making the, um, not in character with the neighborhood. So it's just a fully conforming lot. So, and then having a attached garage, I think will be, you know, it will look a lot bulkier than having the detached. I agree. So I don't know if the commissioners have had a chance, but um, there's a suggested uh, wording of a motion if someone would like to make that. There was an information that Anna had sent out maybe about three o'clock. Oh, Peter, so any chance you would look at it? Uh, no, let me take a look. Well, I tell you what, th this is against Robert's rules of law, but let me read something and then someone else can make that motion. That'll help us move along. Uh, the motion is to approve, uh, whoever's going to make it, to approve the requested waiver of the sewer regulations, Article 3, Section 2, in order to approve a single service sewer connection to, 20, to 19A Central Street based upon the preponderance of the evidence presented by the applicant and further described in the memorandum issued by the commission from the director dated September 2nd, 2020. Would someone like to make that motion? I so move, Andrew Boardman. <laughs> Thank you. Is there a second? I'd like to make an amendment. Yes, Peter. I would amend it to say provided uh, that he works on or the applicant works on uh, installing high efficiency water consuming devices. Try that again, Peter. I would add, provided, comma, provided the that the applicant yep. work toward installing installs high efficiency water consuming devices. Okay, uh, let me try. Okay, is there a second for that amendment? Is that within our purview? That's the only thing I don't know. I didn't catch it, Andrew. Sorry. Is that within our purview? Can we actually do that? Or is this more uh, whether we're just waiving the capacity? I just, I, I like the idea. I just don't know if we can. That's all I want to confirm. And that would be a question for Anna or. Okay, so, okay, I'm still looking for a second. Yeah. Okay, not hearing any second. Um, is there a second to the original motion which I, which Andrew has made? I second it. Okay, that was Casey Winslow for the record. Is there further discussion? Well, I would agree with Peter, I'm sorry, with Andrew that I just don't know, like, it, and it seems like kind of a vague outline of you know high efficiency it seems a little vague well maybe the director could uh, uh, explain the process that we go through with most applicants we, where they have to uh, describe uh, the water consuming um, devices and then what efficiency they're going to use 
Yeah, I think it's possible for us to, and staff often does this with owners and, and developers, you know, sort of identifying uh, water efficiency uh, appliances, um, toilets, washing machines, that sort of thing. Sounds like Matt's open to that. Um, I know Melissa's worked with many households, um, so we can I'm sure we can incorporate those into the uh, final uh, review, but we can we can address that in the water service application process. Any other questions or comments from the commissioners? So just to be clear, you're going to um, do that during their application? Yes. Okay. If, if Matt is, uh, he's agreeable, we'll be working with him on that. Okay, in that case, we're, we're going to roll call. To I'm sorry? Yes, I am agreeable to that. Thank you, Matt. We're going to have a roll call vote on this uh, motion from Andrew. Uh, James Terry, yes. Casey Winslow? Aye. Andrew Boardman? Yes. Peter Wallace? Yes. Thank you. We have a vote. Thank you for joining us, Matt. Okay. I'd like to thank the commission and uh, staff for their time tonight. Thank you very much. Okay. The next item on our agenda is town, town meeting preparation. Um, most of our, or all of the articles that affect the Public Works Commission are expected to be on the uh, consent calendar. And uh, Alan has indicated that any, if anything comes off the consent calendar, he will find me so that we can make whatever presentation information is necessary. I don't expect that that will happen, but it could. Anything you want to add, Alan? Yeah, it's just to make, uh, make it clear. And I think uh, if you all uh, subscribe or any of the you know, audience subscribes to News and Notice, um, I know the moderator and town have been earnestly trying to get information out uh, in anticipation of this. Uh, town meeting. It's very unusual. They're doing, taking every provision they can to uh, make it concise. Um, so as a reminder, it's uh, presently uh, scheduled for this Sunday to begin at one o'clock up at the uh, Doug uh, White uh, Fields at the Concord Carlisle Regional High School. Um, there may be some <coughs> little walking to get up to the fields. The parking is probably going to be a little bit of an issue. Uh, but with um, attention to COVID and precautions and hygiene, there are certain measures that would be taken into account to allow for appropriate spacing. Um, it's all outdoors. And of course, it is weather dependent because of that. Uh, if it were to be uh, a, a rain delay or something, um, I know they're convening on Friday evening to evaluate, you know, staff will be looking at what the conditions look like, uh, but there is a back update of uh, Monday the 14th uh, to begin at 5 p.m. They want to get all the business done in one uh, event. So if they start Sunday, they're going to try to get through it. Uh, the way they've packaged the consent calendar, it does include Article 18, the Solid Waste Disposal Fund Expenditures, Article 19 and 20, the Sewer System Expenditures and the Improvement Fund. In Article 21, the water system expenditures. I'll also note that anybody who's interested in any of these articles can go to the town's website where we've done a great job as far as uh, highlighting, <coughs> excuse me, all of the Zoom meetings and hearings that uh, led up to this town meeting. So if you're interested in any particular article, um, you can get some of the background um, before you attend at your leisure and convenience. So it's, it's important you're aware of that. And um, is uh, because of the brevity, uh, it's, it's highly unlikely there's going to be a call for um, one of our articles to be pulled. If it were to be pulled, I'd uh, uh, step aside with uh, Jim, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, you know, review what the issues are, but it's highly unlikely and it's, it's a very unusual event because of the, the need to be uh, brief. And the town has really put hours and hours and hours of outreach trying to inform people what they're doing. Um, some articles have been removed. Some are, you know, will be uh, discussed, but most of the information you have is available on the website. And I recommend you go there. So with that said, 
think it's just important to be aware of the, the process. Thanks, Alan. Uh, the next item on our agenda is the director's report. Okay, I'm going to see if we have our team here. Um, okay, I've got uh, Steve Duker. And as we do the director's report, as you know, I like to have the various program managers present the update um, and with, with pictures, because pictures uh, tell a lot more of the story than the narratives that we provide you. So uh, with that said, I'm going to try and uh, see if I can get this, uh, share the screen and we'll go uh, program manager to program manager through the director's report. So give me one second, make sure I'm Hold on. Share screen. Here we go. All right. Very good. Okay. Uh, with that said, uh, Melissa Simoncini, if you want to make yourself visible and audible, uh, you can start, start us off with some of the re solid waste and recycling programs and some of the things that have, you've been doing to innovate during these COVID times it might be helpful. Great. Thank you, Alan. Can you guys hear me okay? I have new headphones that were found in my office drawer over here. <laughs> Um, good evening, everyone. I'm Melissa Simoncini, the Environmental Services Program Administrator. Um, I guess this is my second or third PwC meeting in this role, and I'd like to say a lot has changed and we've come pretty far in just a couple months. Um, I deal a lot with the curbside program, environmental compliance, and all the different recycling events. And to start, off off, start us off on a high note, I'm pleased to announce that we are gonna be having a drop-off event um, in October. So Saturday, October 17th. It will not be a swap-off event, um, but we just as of yesterday afternoon, I got the final blessing from the health department that said, our plans look like they're coming along fine and we can start with uh, volunteer recruitment um, it has been um, quite an interesting season of trying to figure out how to make recycling events happen in the land of social distancing and um, just personal safety. So, um, Alan, can you actually skip ahead or Anna, skip ahead two slides for me? We'll come back to that one. Um, so I've been working with Reuse It um, to kind of put our heads together to see what type of, we're calling them mini events, um, we can pull together um, over the last month or so to help offset some of the demand on drop-off day. Um, so one of the mini events that we've been hosting for the last uh, about three and a half weeks now is on Thursday nights, we've been collecting bulbs and batteries. Um, each one of these events we have people pre-register for, so they have to submit their contact information, they reserve a time slot online, and they kind of have, commit to following a set of rules, you know, staying in your car, masks required, pre-sorting batteries to make them um, go smoothly. Um, in, you know, just the first three collections, um, we've had over 70 people participate in the event and everybody has been very happy to have an opportunity to um, drop off stuff. Typically people would just drop off bulbs and batteries, mercury containing items right at our front door. Um, and historically, it hasn't been too bad because there have been people present and we've been able to pick them up pretty quickly. But now with the town offices closed, it was getting a little hairy just having people leave stuff outside. There was one day I came in to a, a bunch of paper towels with tape around it saying, caution, mercury. <laughs> and so we didn't know what it was in it. So, you know, not only is it against state regulations, it's also unsafe. So we're looking for ways to create safe outlets. Um, uh, next slide, please. And, and this is just a picture of kind of our safe 
disposals and gentlemen, you know, handing me some nice long bulbs and they would bring their batteries and just put them in the appropriate boxes. And then once they stepped away and they were all good, I'd put them back in the buckets. Next slide, please. And another mini event that we've been hosting for the last three weeks is almost a pay as you throw styrofoam event. Um, Cause styrofoam was often one of those big things that people would just come to drop off day for styrofoam. Um, and with all the shipping that people are receiving at home, people had a lot of cardboard stored up in, or that's another uh, topic, but uh, a lot of styrofoam stored up in their basements. Um, so what we did is we had people, this was a practice for signing up online and also paying online. So the public is learning and we're learning how to facilitate these types of um, payments also. Um, so we've collected, you know, at the end of the event and the event will end on Saturday, we've collected over 200 bags of styrofoam and there'll be two container fulls like you just saw there. And then we're moving on to household hazardous waste collection. Every other year we host a, an event here in Concord for Concord residents to safely dispose of all that stuff that's been in your basement for years that you don't use anymore. Um, now's your opportunity. Um, it'll be next Monday evening. Hopefully that doesn't conflict with a post, a pushed out town meeting, um, but we'll deal with that bridge if we get there. Um, and um, typically about 200 people attend this event. So far we have about a third of those signed up. So tell all your friends, um, let them know that they can drop off their hazardous waste in town. They just need to sign up um, for it. Um, we also have the opportunity, we're part of the Minuteman um, ha Household Hazardous Waste Consortium, which is eight different neighboring communities and curbside customers and residents can go once a month to the hazardous waste facility in Lexington. Those are also all um, kind of pre-registration events this year um, so that they, we can all do contract taste, con Tract tracing. I can't speak today. And um, yeah, contact tracing. And it also allows us to staff them appropriately. Um, so the other events that we typically host, um, business recycling is going off on September 25th. Um, we're just working on getting the sign up going for that. And in addition to business recycling, which, you know, doesn't have a huge draw, um, we typically only get about 20 businesses. We've, oh, we're going to open it up to residents afterwards. So we'll have like an eight to 10 in the morning for businesses to bring their items in. And then those same vendors will be available from eight or from 10 to 12 for residents to bring items in. And hopefully that will also um, buffer some of the demand on drop off day for the people who are just bringing electronic devices. And you know, just a note, we're still not accepting hard drives at the um, electronics recycling events uh, because the investigation is still pending. Um, and quickly moving on to the curbside program. Um, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but there has been quite an influx of cardboard here at CPW. We're working on getting more boxes, but because people are getting more stuff shipped to their home, um, there is a big need for more cardboard uh, in the domestic cardboard market just to provide all those boxes. So um, believe it or not, pizza boxes have been able to be recycled for about the last five years, but there was never a big push because they really didn't need any additional cardboard. But with all this extra demand, um, the uh, recycling associations have now come out with a good campaign that your pizza boxes are able to be thrown in your recycling bins or brought here to CPW so that they can be recycled. The one caveat is they don't want your pizza crust or your cheese. So a little bit of grease or a lot of bit of grease is fine. The, uh, the recycling machinery can handle it um, and the product is still clean enough. Um, just no pizza crusts. Um, and kind of on the same land of, you know, the curbside program, uh, we've been working with waste management um, quite a bit throughout COVID. Um, they, they've been pretty good to us, um, but they have a pretty, a very strict sick policy. Um, and 
also combined with the kind of extra funding through the unemployment, waste management's been kind of understaffed. Um, so what that's meant is that sometimes they have um, substitute drivers come in. And as a result, um, waste management has um, prioritized their municipal customers. So we haven't seen it as much as the private industry has, believe it or not. You know, so those are kind of like the commercial businesses that they have on the side. Um, but some people have had kind of some missed pickups and some challenges there. Um, so, you know, if you hear of anybody having missed pickups, you know, two things that are really helpful is if people have their, make sure that they have their bins out by 7 a.m. Um, some people typically they'll just, oh, my driver comes at 10, so I'll make sure they're out by 10. But if we have one of those substitute drivers, it makes it, it difficult. Um, for them to get, get it all done because they may do, drive the route in a different direction or do it in a different order. Um, and then also, if there's any missed pickups um, that you notice, just give us a call. We'll talk to waste management and we'll um, get it taken care of. You know, our customers are our first line of defense. Um, they typically know earlier than waste management knows if uh, something's been missed. Um, so, we're getting on it. Um, waste management act has actually called in some forces from the national waste management system um, to kind of make sure that the Northeast, because we've been pretty hard hit, um, has the support that it needs to um, get with our customers. So that's a positive. Um, and then the next thing that I am, you know, in working with is kind of environmental compliance. And one of the things that we do is um, for any of the CPW facilities, we do tank inspections. And this photo is just a quick example of um, our annual tank inspection that happens over at the wastewater treatment plant. We have two underground storage tanks, one um, out here at on Kai's Road, which will be uh, removed sometime in the next six months um, when the uh, project is replaced. They're both for backup power generation. And um, so then our last underground storage tank will be um, at the wastewater treatment plant. And there's monthly inspections that we do, annual inspections that we do, and then even three-year inspections that we do. Um, but all tanks get an A plus and uh, we'll go from there. Thank you, Melissa. We'll uh, move on to Steve Dukren. Are you available, Steve? Uh oh. Here you go. Steve, we can't hear you. Yep. So I'm going to step in. Steve, for you right now, I think the you know primary focus uh, with engineering, uh, you're all aware of the Cambridge Turnpike. Steve, if you can speak, you know, feel free to step in, but I'll walk them through these slides. Uh, what you see is some of the crosswalks. This is over at the Concord Museum. You can see a new brick crosswalk that's been installed as part of you know the project. Um, I think if you're looking up here. You'll see this is Lexington Road up here, and you'll see some improvements with a uh, rain garden. Sort of this is stormwater management feature. Um, this is the Emerson House over to the right. Um, what you can see is a transition from the kind of standard asphalt drive or, or a sidewalk. You have a new hydration station that's readily available, and you cross over uh, sort of this P stone. Um, walkway to continue on up uh, Cambridge Turnpike. Um, and you can see we're getting close to some of the finishing touches on <coughs> this long and kind of a uh, fairly protect, protracted project. You can see the paving has been complete. This is a section, we have different sections, we call this section two, um, where you can see uh, Hello? Not sure where that noise is coming from, uh, but we'll just move through. This is looking out um, over Elm Brook, and you can see this is towards Route 2 in this direction. Uh, we're putting wall footings construction. This is a section near the existing culverts down by Crosby Dam. And uh, one of the interesting things is along the culverts in the dam area, uh, or the uh, Crosby Pond, 
is we had to do directional drilling of water main under uh, these, these culvert sections as well as these deep ground improvements. And you have a, a, a very large, you may have seen these ditch witches for irrigation systems. They're very small. This is much more of an industrial size uh, unit that actually uh, what you do is you put a boring, you know, under, as long as the materials allow, um, as long as it's unconsolidated, not ledge, you know, they'd have to, you know, kind of they, they pour through and then they pull the main. This is high density polyethylene uh, water main that is pulled under um, as one continuous pull. It's all fused together in sections on the site and then pulled in a reamed out um, uh, borehole that's been put under the culvert. It's interesting, uh, eventually the intake line that we're talking about at um, Nagog Pond is going to be made of very similar material. You know, here you can kind of see it used for uh, water main conveyance. Um, engineering division has also been involved in working closely with our um, highway and grounds group on, uh, we've talked about some of the uh, initiatives and projects in downtown uh, Concord and West Concord to accommodate uh, some of the outdoor dining, some of the uh, events, you know, there's been some weekend events that uh, Public Works has been participating in to try to make a combination of what we know is not ideal outdoor settings, but our focus is sort of safety and uh, access. And so we work closely with the townhouse and the fire, uh, uh, fire department and police department to make sure we can sort of set up these, stage these events. And they've been pretty well received. Um, you can see, you know, the mobilization and then demobilization has been quite an effort on uh, all of our, our parts. Um, Aaron Amaposco, are you available? Yes, I am. Okay, great. You want to step in and talk about some of the programs that you've been managing? Yes, we'll do. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Aaron McClosco. I'm the Highway and Ground Superintendent for Concord Public Works. Um, so in the, uh, the director's report detailed, uh, you know, the work that we've accomplished in the last couple of months. Uh, it's been a very busy summer season for the Highway and Grounds Division, um, working to get caught up on our spring and summer maintenance programs. Um, we've struggled with kind of staffing and labor resource issues as a result of the COVID, um, some non-hiring that we have, vacancies that we have, and also the, the lack of uh, uh, the MCI um, prison crew that we typically get, a uh, six-person prison crew every day. Um, so we've been working a little bit overtime um, and then to try to get caught up. Uh, we're in a good spot right now, caught up with our spring and summer programs, getting ready to, to transition into fall. Uh, some of these photos will show, um, you know, some of the projects that we've been working on uh, to support some of the other departments in town uh, with their struggles and, and uh, kind of reopening plans as it relates to, to the COVID-19. Uh, these first two photos show uh, our CPW highway crew. Uh, prepping and paving an area of the parking lot over at the Sanborn School. This is a request that came in from the school department um, to modify their visitor parking area to turn it into a bus depot drop-off area. Um, so we increased the travel lanes and the turning radius uh, required for the buses to be able to um, travel through this parking area that was originally designed for um, pedestrian or excuse me, a passenger vehicle traffic only. Uh, this is a requirement of their kind of reopening plan to accommodate more passenger vehicles as uh, as the schools have kind of restricted the capacity in their school buses, resulting in, in more parents having to bring their kids to school. Um, this is a, uh, what's called a last minute request. We received the request about two weeks before school opened. Um, so we planned uh, the, the project. Uh, we actually rented that paving machine that's, that's in this photo here with some very skilled equipment operators. Uh, they were able to come in, train quickly on the equipment, operate the equipment, and we're able to complete this project in under five days uh, with our with our all in-house crew and in-house labor. Um, the school department was looking to contract it out. And we were able to help them and save them quite a bit of money by doing it in-house. Uh, this second photo is a sidewalk repair down on um, Monument Square. You can see it's the driveway to the parking lot going behind um, the businesses and shops that were along Main Street. Um, con uh, concrete sidewalk repair there. Um, that was prepped in one section was paved and an area blocked off. Uh, another concrete uh, sidewalk repair that we completed in town. Um, we've recently retrofitted one of our older dump bodies for our uh, swap loader heavy duty trucks to uh, create a, a concrete uh, mixing station, almost like our own little ready mix truck. So we're able to uh, 
prep and mix a variety of uh, sized concrete batches to accommodate our needs to allow us uh, some more flexibility um, in um, you know, our operations and allow us to do a wider variety of, of repairs within the right of way. This is a photo of a fence repair. Um, obviously, we're highway and grounds, but uh, you know we will maintain anything that's within the right of way. It's a you know wide range of infrastructure from roads to sidewalks to trees to storm drains and even even wood wood rail fencing um, that you know is in need of repair. So this is a long section of repair. We don't do this every day. Uh, came out uh, it's a great great product, great job by the crews uh, getting this fence area repaired. Um, obviously, this allows for safer pedestrian traffic along that um, that that downward slope along the sidewalk. Uh, this is a section, uh, or excuse me, a photo of, a, of an area that we, um, again, the earlier photo showed, we've been working closely with the downtown businesses uh, and, and shop owners to allow them to use the public right of way for outdoor event setup. Uh, this is a photo of the crew setting um, a 10 foot Jersey concrete barrier. Uh, these are very heavy barriers, um, take quite a bit of time and effort to to plan and set these up, work closely with engineering department as, as Alan referenced to make sure we allow for safe use of this right of way that was not intended for pedestrian or commercial um, setup. Uh, so we use concrete barriers to make sure we are protecting anybody that is within the area and then the poly barriers to um, dampen any blow to a motor vehicle that may struck, uh, strike a concrete barrier. Um, so a lot of time planning, um, resources go into those setups. Uh, it is quite a bit of effort. Um, but I think it's it, all in all, it's very uh, successful events that we've had working closely with um, other town departments, such as the tourism uh, department and um, the townhouse and also the local businesses to bring people into town. This is a photo of our uh, Toro ground master mower. Uh, we, in a previous report earlier this summer, we were, you know, were able to purchase a new mower as was um, funded in a previous town meeting. Um, mowers operational down on Sanborn Fields. Um, mowing the field. It's been a very, even though we're in a drought situation, the grass continues to grow. Um, we've toned back our irrigation systems um, so that, you know, we are, while many of our irrigation systems are not connected to the um, public drinking water supply, we want to make sure that we are being, you know, good stewards of the resources as well. Um, so grass is still growing. Um, soccer season is, is, is just about to start. We're working closely with Conquer Kyle Isle Youth Soccer League. Um, they are looking to start using fields next week. We actually have had meetings with them and are planning to prepare those fields and get them lined and ready to meet their needs. Um, we've also been working closely with Conquer Kylo Youth Baseball Softball um, on making sure that our baseball fields are in, are in you know, premier condition throughout this throughout the season. Uh, this photo is a photo of one of our park and tree specialists up in the, we have an 80 foot bucket truck, you can see here. Um, up there pruning the tree. There's kind of a, a wide area photo and a zoomed in photo. We do a variety of tree work um, and grounds maintenance throughout town. It's been a very busy uh, tree maintenance season. Um, and, you know, a lot of maintenance. We've had some removals. We had a tree hearing a couple of weeks ago. Um, and we are actually getting ready to ramp up our tree planting program for the fall, which we will be uh, rolling out here later this month. Thank you. All right, thank you, Aaron. And then uh, just to uh, wrap up on the water uh, sewer division activities, um, I am pleased to say I don't have a photo, but as of uh, yesterday, uh, pleased to say uh, that we have a new water sewer superintendent. Um, he wasn't able to participate in generating this presentation but um, John Rogers is on the call. He's observing as we speak and very thankful to have um, you know, John to support. Comes to the uh, department with a, a lot of experience in water, water resource management, uh, drinking water, storm water, design engineering. Um, has also worked for other municipalities in their capital planning groups and he's a, a big proponent of asset management and knowing sort of the needs of our infrastructure and where we're going in the future. A uh, very welcome addition to the team. So it's nice to have him on board. Um, with some of the infrastructure improvements, uh, we've talked about the work over in the uh, Prescott Road, uh, Peter Spring Road uh, neighborhood. 
Um, we have been uh, you know, working uh, diligently um, with um, you know, our contract uh, op, um, a contractor. Um, we have been installing mainline uh, water mains in. Uh, we will probably be following up with service laterals um, you know, fairly soon. It looks like based on the schedule of work, uh, we're looking for a completion of somewhere in early to mid November. Um, one of the reasons, something that's important noting is that we had originally planned to uh, reclaim the road um, this fall but based on the town meeting uh, schedule, the available funds we have in the roads program. Uh, we've opted to allow for a little longer window of time to get the water main in. And if you sort of get up into the neighborhood, the contractor's done a very good job as far as uh, taking care of the open trenches, putting down a, uh, a patch so that uh, if we can get through the winter, um, allow some settling, if any, um, they'd be responsible for maintaining it through the winter and then uh, you know, working with the roads program and engineering on the reclaim uh, binder and then a, uh, a permanent you know, surface uh, next probably you know, spring into you know, the summer of next year to finish the road work. Um, you may have heard, and if you didn't hear, you probably experienced uh, one of the more notable water main um, breaks that I've observed in 24 years uh, in Concord. Uh, this was at the intersection of Maine and Thoreau. Uh, so major intersection, uh, literally uh, the break, and I have a picture of uh, the pipe. This is a 12 inch pipe and you can see sections of it missing. It's a uh, date from 1947. Um, it resulted when it went uh, water pressure drop throughout town. I don't think it was a, a neighborhood in town who didn't see some indication of this break. Uh, and it was you know, significant uh, as far as pressure in town. The cruise, I think it occurred just afternoon on a Thursday. Um, you see the crews isolating, trying to get on gate valves that are actually submerged to try and control and shut the water down. Um, you see sort of a depression in the road. This is where the water was coming up, but it actually spread across and through the intersection and created sort of a major disturbance of the roadway as well as the immediate area where, where the break was. Um, we're ex excavating down um, and basically by noon the next day, this was one of the most well collaborated responses I've seen where Water sewer isolated. We got a, a third party contractor to come in with an excavator. They worked with our uh, operations personnel. Highway grounds uh, provided operators to help with trucking. Um, we, the main was repaired by early evening. Um, and then uh, working with highway grounds, we cleared a lot of the asphalt out of the intersection and had a third party contractor in uh, setting um, a permanent patch uh, at 6 a.m. the next morning and by noon on Friday the intersection was opened up and restored and if you drive over it it might look like it's uh, you know was was planned but the fact that we were able to uh, respond address the problem and even make you know some you know kind of my, you know, immediate quick repairs to the damaged roadway uh, so quickly uh, is really a testament to the entire department including the engineering division who was out to help you know, assess the impact of the damage, highway and grounds to uh, respond to the, the road and make some of the contacts with their um, contractors with the, the paving. So it's a, a real success and um, unfortunately a result of you know, older infrastructure that will go. Um, on Kai's Road, we're still moving uh, more slowly than we would like on the um, improvements that are, have been slated for the low road sewer pump station in the Acibit Road, uh, the Acibit um, Main Street pump station. Um, the problem is deliveries and materials in COVID, uh, some lead time issues that are really getting in the way of our, our, our progress. Uh, there's no impact on service you know, during this time. 
um, but it has uh, resulted in extended schedule. And what you see back here is, and, and I've sort of, I don't, it's a picture of the, the pad or pedestal where the emergency generator is going to be housed. It's going to um, power both uh, 135 Kai's Road, our office, highway grounds, and water sewer offices, and operation area, as well as the uh, station on uh, Bull Road, the sewer pump station. And um, last but not least, you know, on behalf of all the operations people and, and uh, managerial professionals in public works, um, again, want to say uh, thank you to uh, Peter Wallace for uh, many years of service on the board. Um, he's been a great uh, addition to the team. He's always been you know, very supportive, uh, but at the same time, you know, inquisitive. He sort of uh, challenges on certain decision-making processes and protocols, especially when it comes to uh, security, um, and you know, but also appreciates the value and need of you know, uh, rates that are commensurate with needs, and has always been very supportive of understanding our budgets and uh, being an advocate. So um, on behalf of the entire staff, uh, Peter, you know, thank you very much, and uh, we hope we will be kind of seeing you around town um, as, we, as you go on to other endeavors, we'll continue to be providing the essential services that uh, I think you know and, and uh, appreciate more than most. So thanks again. So that's, in essence, the director's report. Uh, I don't know if you have any questions for the staff, any of the projects, updates. All right. Well, thank you, Ellen, and thank you for all from all the supervisors too. I think that the reports that we've that we're getting now are just amazing. And I, on behalf of the commission, I think you, if you could send information back to all the rest of the staff who've been doing a a yeoman's job, that would be appreciated also. Thank you. Are there any other comments or questions from the commissioners? No, I just I just wanted to commend everybody on the storm response when we had the high winds and the trees down. Um, there weren't any specific calls that I was aware of where I was, but um, the staff came by and cleared sidewalks, which isn't really necessary, but it, it gave everybody a good sense that, you know, that that they were looking at looking out for everybody and, and people appreciated it. So thank you for that. I do appreciate it. Uh, this is Casey. I, I just want to say thank you to Peter for his service and it's been a lot of fun working with him and I hope he comes back to visit and see him around town. It's, 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 I, I wanted to have the same kind of comments off to Peter. I appreciated uh, working with him and the fact that he always seems to raise the questions that uh, we, we sort of thought about but didn't know how to put it into words. Well, I want to thank uh, the committee very much and uh, the director and the whole team and the staff. It has been a privilege for me to uh, be a part of the commission and um, I've always been very impressed with how well run the uh, department is and so forth. So uh, really, it's been an honor and I thank you very much. Thanks, Peter. Uh, one point of information for the rest of the people um, on the call today is Jeff Fasser, and he will be one of the members who will be joining us after a town meeting uh, as a new commissioner. Um, are there any public comments? Anna, do you see anybody raising their hand? No, I don't see anyone. In that case, uh, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Is there, is there such a motion? Uh, I'll motion to adjourn. I'll motion to adjourn, Andrew Boardman. Okay. Casey Winslow, I'll second. Okay. Let's take on a roll call vote. Jim Terry, yes. Casey Winslow. Aye. Andrew Boardman. Yes. Peter Wallace. Yes. Thank you, everyone. This concludes our meeting of the Public Works Commission in September 9th, 2020. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a nice night.